What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Jay Martin Show. I'm still in the remote studio today, traveling a little bit longer, but we got to get it done. Today, my guest is Jeff Snyder of Eurodollar University. So we began talking about US dollar as a reserve currency. We talked about deglobalization and the reshoring of major industries and how that's going to impact the American middle class. And then we got into his predictions and speculations about the future of reserve currencies and his answer or prediction really surprised me and I think it's going to surprise you too. Anyways, this was super, super fun. I hope you enjoy this one. As always, beneath this video or podcast, there's a link in the description where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I publish every Sunday and I absolutely love writing it. I'd love to have you join the team. All right, here's Jeff Snyder. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, welcome back to the Jay Martin Show, and I'm joined once again by Jeff Snyder. Jeff, thanks so much for making the time. I'm stoked to chat with you today. Hi, Jay. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm in the remote studio again for a few more days here, but we're getting it done. Yeah. So an interesting place I wanted to start with you today would be, you know, if we look at like broad strokes history, right? Often what we end up focusing on are the unintended consequences that become far more consequential than we thought they would be, right? Humans make little decisions along our path, and we're very poor at predicting the ripple effects of these decisions. So Are you, you're getting into chaos theory here and, uh, multi, you know, multifractal geometry. So <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do our best. You know, let's start here. Uh, it was last week, uh, Jay Powell came out and said, look, you know, if the Fed over tightens, we can cut as if that's an easy fix, right? And if we under tighten, it's a bigger problem. And I'm wondering, you know, we're not going to know if they go too far until a few quarters down the road, because these things take time to play out, right? And those ripple effects take time to see, you know, what are the unintended consequences that you're concerned about right now with this policy? Well, I, I actually think it's out of the hands of the Fed to begin with. I think that the economy has been set on motion from the very moment we had the supply shock back in 2020 and 2021. And so there was almost an inevitability to the downside end of it. And um, in March, when oil prices shot up into you know the 120 some dollars a barrel after Russia, Ukraine, all that stuff, I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. So even before the Fed started hiking rates, let alone aggressively, these events had been already been set in motion. Talk about ripple effect. It was the ripple effect from 2021, the whole year earlier. And it's not just the U.S. economy. You look at other places around the world, specifically like Japan, um, who, again, a little bit further along in that and down that road toward um, inevitable decline, mm -hmm. uh, recession, whatever that looks like. I think that was uh, that was, as I said, set in motion you know, last year. And then really the trigger was March of this year. We see that in not just economic data. Look at a lot of economic data. It looks like the economy sort of struck the wall in March, March and April, specifically the labor market data. Um, but financials, um, yield curve, euro dollar futures curve, big, big imprint in March, and then a bigger, uh, bigger drop in June, which accelerated, which, which it picked up in the acceleration and in acceleration and decline. All of which you put these things together, and it looks like you know, doesn't matter what the Fed does. Um, this thing is already moving in the direction that it's moving. And that's really what inversion is saying is the Fed's going to hike until it, it realizes it's wrong. Um, so we're getting closer to that point where the Fed realizes it's wrong, but it doesn't matter how far the Fed goes because the, you know, you never want to say anything was 100% certain. And we obviously, we don't have a crystal ball, but the markets are pretty, pretty certain about what, what the end of this year and next year looks like. So let's walk into that a little bit, because when you say things are already moving in the direction that they're moving, you know, depending on who I'm sitting down with, they're moving towards hyperinflation. They're moving towards <laughs> the crash of the dollar. You know, they're moving towards various things. Actually, you've been a really great, like temperate voice when everybody was talking about inflation, inflation, inflation. You know, you were a few of the voices that I would tune into to just get the other side of the picture and bring me back to the mean. You know what I mean? So what are you what are you focused on? What are we we're moving towards? Moving in the direction already, what's what's down that path? What does that look like? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's not secular inflation. It's certainly not hyperinflation. It's not the dollar collapse, which obviously, I mean, here we are in November of 2022 and the dollar is screaming higher. At least it was, I mean, short-term fluctuations recently aside, up yeah. until September and October, the dollar has just gone flying through the roof, which is, 
indicative of all these other things that we've been talking about, which is deflationary monetary circumstances, which means that in the U.S. economy, it's probably disinflationary along with recession, which means strictly in terms of consumer prices, consumer prices are going to decelerate. Whether they outright decline or not, um, that's an open question. Although I will say that in the CPI report that we just got this week, services prices actually declined, which is unusual. Services price prices, even on a monthly basis, only declined five times between 2009 and 2020. So, you know, maybe there is actually deflationary pressures in that will hit the U.S. But overall, what we're looking at is consumer prices are going to decelerate um, substantially. That's what markets are pricing. That's what it looks like. And that's I think that's why there was such a major reaction to the CPI report. It wasn't necessarily the headline or the core rate is a lot of the internals are starting to point in that direction, which is, again, going back to correctly uh, correctly categorizing what the economy has been going through over the last couple of years as a supply shock rather than inflation. This was, again, the sort of the predicted expected outcome. And now we're seeing more and more confirmation that that has actually been the case. So when it comes to supply, sh supply shock, here's one thing that I'm, I'm wondering about right now. Like, we're seeing a bit of a, a reshuffling of the geopolitical chessboard, right? And maybe for most of my lifetime, we've existed in this place of reasonable trust, right? Where we we trust each other, as in, you know, geopolitical powers trust each other enough to take products to the market, get labor from China, get energy from Russia or Saudi Arabia, capital from the US, whatever, and the world can function together. That's that's deflationary is it not it brings costs down because you can take your inputs to market and get the cheapest provider but if we're if that trust is broken and maybe i'm wrong on that but if that trust is broken and we're moving into the next era right of whatever that geopolitical box looks like as we reshore industries and we don't have access to the market of inputs is that not inflationary or does that not create a prolonged supply shock as we rebuild um, our manufacturing industries. What do you think about that? It's an interesting question. I don't look at it as inflation or deflation because as we you know, the wave of globalization that began generations ago, you know, in the post-war era that really reached its crescendo um, 1980s, 1990s into the 2000s, consistent with monetary and financial growth uh, because those two things always go hand in hand. And you're right. As we trade more, we trust more, right? The more we do business, the more we have tighter relationships, the more there is trust. But I don't think that was necessarily deflationary. I wouldn't categorize it as deflationary. I know that was, you know, the 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 uh, the result or the the implication was that prices were held low, but it wasn't deflationary so much as it was rising and raising efficiency. Uh, right. Economic efficiency skyrocketed, and as we know in any capitalist free market society, efficiency is inherently Again, I don't want to say we're deflationary, but it's it's beneficial. It allows for sustainable economic growth because we can do more with less. It's more efficient. So if we go into an era of reversing all of that, deglobalization, which we're 15 years into it. So I think it's probably a pretty good bet it's happening. It's just now becoming noticeable, certainly in a geopolitical context. But we're 15 years into deglobalization. That doesn't necessarily make it in, it doesn't make it inflationary. It means that the economy is becoming more inefficient. And as inefficiency uh, rises in any economic system, that could also be again. I don't want to use the word, but deflationary because drags in economic growth tend to depress labor market efficiency, wages, all those kinds of things. So. It isn't necessarily the case that as we deglobalize, globalize, as we trust each other less, things begin to fragment even further than they have, including financial and monetary systems. I don't think that's inherently inflationary either. I think it's inherently inefficient, which is even worse because it means the economy has another major headwind that it needs to try to navigate through, which just depresses economic growth which is the last thing we need after 15 years of very little economic or actually very uh, almost no economic growth. So you're right. And reshoring uh, deglobalization is suddenly making heads headlines. You mentioned this process began 15 years ago. Can you speak to that point a little bit? Because I'm curious, like what trigger point, what shift occurred 15 years ago that began this trajectory? It was monetary system. Deglobal 
globalization, we like to think of the globalization of the last half of the 20th century as sort of the first one in human history when it's really not. Globalization mm-hmm. happens occasionally. And it's always tied to monetary conditions. So we had the euro dollar system develop in the late 1950s that financed essentially this globalization wave that we all benefited from, though unevenly. The entire world, the amount of prosperity that was generated in the last half of the 20th century is just unparalleled in human history because in big part, there was money there to finance capital and trade flows and all of these other things that allowed um, essentially countries that had been subsistence, you know, subsistence agricultural systems like China, suddenly they're a modern economic powerhouse. Mm. So if there, because there was the money there to do it, we could, we could uh, in its best format, money is efficiency. Money allows specialization. Money allows trade and all these other things to happen, which creates the sustainable processes that, that uh, lead to prosperity and real wealth creation. So what happened in August on August 9th of 2007, the monetary system broke. And unfortunately, most people believe it was fixed by the Fed doing QE when that was not the case at all. And this is a long conversation. The, the, the short version is that the monetary system, when it broke on August 9th, 2007, that wasn't a one-off. That was a permanent disrepair. And so over the last 15 years, while everybody thinks that the, the Fed has printed way too much money, we have actually suffered from the opposite condition, which is not enough money, which has been a drag on growth. And that has forced deglobalization even before we got to the last couple of years of you know, geopolitical tensions and everything else. Those are actually related to it. But for the last 15 years, the money has been increasingly disappearing, which means it's not growing as quickly as we need it to grow in order to finance globalization and trade in the way that it did in the pre-crisis era. So that is forcing the deglobalization, which is leading to all these consequences down the road. If you enjoy my content, let's take the next step. I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free every Sunday. The link to subscribe is right beneath this video. I share my key takeaways and action items from conversations just like this and plenty others. So join me and 50,000 other investors for this exclusive content weekly by hitting that link. All right, back to the interview. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question that may seem somewhat juvenile, and I want you to give me the most basic answer you possibly can think of. When you say the money was disappearing, is this relative to the debt that was accumulating, or can you explain that concept to me a little bit? It all goes back to where money comes from. Who gets to create it? And everybody thinks it's government or the Federal Reserve, and it's it's never it's in the modern era, it's never been those. Um, the great inflation of the 1970s, that wasn't the Fed. That was the banking system. The banking system is where money comes from. And this euro dollar system is offshore, which means it's outside the jurisdiction, the regulations of pretty much every country on earth. That's what offshore really means. And so that gave banks that operate in this global monetary system basically free reign to create money and intermediate as they saw fit, which they did. They radically evolved how banks operate as well as what money even is in the modern sense. Um, But... There's always a downside with that, inherent risks, because when you give banks free reign, they tend to go way too far, which is why our subprime mortgages came from, which is why we had massive credit bubbles, 1990s into the 2000s, because we had we were overflowing with money. Um, and then the credit crisis, the, the 2008 crisis happened, which was essentially the system coming to terms with all of its inherent flaws. And because of that, It no longer creates money and credit in the way that it had beforehand, which is another popular misconception. Everybody thinks that we're actually swimming in debt. But if you actually look at the data, what you see is you have parabolic growth up until 2008 and then very limited growth thereafter. So we have a very different system uh, nowadays because the banking system realized the risks involved in the way things were done before and has basically reshaped how money and credit gets created in the post-crisis era, which has left us with not enough money and credit, which again, I know most people, it blows their mind when they hear that, but that's the the truth. The banks are not creating as as much money and credit as the global economy actually needs to sustain globalization or even just uh, minimum levels of economic growth, which is why it's, this is not just a US problem. This is a European problem. It's a global problem. It's a China problem. Countries all over the world, the entire global economy is suffering from deflationary money and has ever since August 2007. 
You know, the, the complexity of your answer speaks to an, an issue, I believe, right? You said earlier, money is efficiency and it should be, right? It should be a simple, um, high utility uh, uh, item that we have access to. For example, I have oil. It's, it's a tool, right? It's not, it's money is not wealth. Money is a right. tool. And it's, and when it's used correctly, it's a tool for commercial transactions. That's right. So if somebody has a really good idea, they need some money to do something. That's where, that's where it should work. Okay. Now I want to get back to the globalization uh, 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 topic for a minute here. So if globalization was a source of abundance for many nations, a lot of emerging markets for sure, uh, did it somewhat hollow out the American middle class in that, right? You you had already a baby boomer generation that entered the labor market all at once, right? And so you had this surplus of labor and finite jobs. And so maybe that's one of the reasons wages remain kind of static after the 70s or so. You can tell me what you think about that. But then once we open up those markets to international labor, now now middle class Americans are competing with the entire world, right? So of course, wages didn't go up. So as we deglobalize and reshore, is this going to add some abundance back to the American middle class? Is that a possibility? If we lived in a ceteris paribus world, it would, right? If all <laughs> else being equal, right. you'd think that would be the case. But as we're saying, well, first of all, let's start with it. The, the, the original premise is, I think, correct, right? Because we had... Um, they had American workers when uh, before we got to globalization, the American economy was more like the American economy. And in, as it globalized, your, as I said before, it was not a clear cut trans. I mean, it was very messy for certain parts of the world. I grew up in the Rust Belt, so I absolutely right. saw the downside of globalization. Yet you can still see the downside, how there's always winners and losers in every in every kind of transformation. Think about the, the transformation from agricultural economies to industrial economies. There are definitely winners and losers. These transitions are extremely messy, sometimes violent. Um, but by and large, when you put it, when you look at it from the uh, global perspective, the globalization trend from the latter half of the 20th century was beneficial to most everybody. Again, the, it was messy. There's winners and losers. Yes, American workers probably were closer toward losers than when, than anybody else in this in this uh, in the transformation. But even so, you look at the average American worker and their 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 living standards. Even though wages were held low, because you're right, they're competing with workers from around the world, still rising living standards because of productivity of the overall system, efficiency of the overall system was what generated wealth in place of those wage gains. So if we go into a deglobalization period that is more inefficient, I don't think that's beneficial to the American worker either because now you have less efficiency, less of what was driving living standards to begin with, and you don't have the jobs that are able to replace what, you know, Yes, there's onshoring taking place, but is that going to be enough to offset jobs that don't happen because of lack of economic growth overall? I think that's really the issue here is it's very difficult to see what doesn't happen, right? We don't care. There's no statistic that tells us these are the jobs that didn't get created because we're in a more inefficient economic environment. Right. But that's, really the, that's really the deficit that we're facing is we don't see the jobs that don't get created, but we feel that they didn't. Okay, that makes sense to me. And yes, I suppose as we reshore, if we successfully reshore industries at any large scale, it's not like we're going back to, you know, boots on the ground assembly lines, right? These jobs will be different. It's not going to be interesting. So then like highly speculative, you know, I like making predictions just because they're fun, but I don't put any weight on them at all. So no sweat there. But if you were to think about, you know, America during the 2010s, 2010 to 2020 versus America during the 2030s, right? 2030 to 2040 is the average american's quality of life going to improve or going to increase or decrease what are your thoughts it all hinges on the monetary question okay uh, because i i tend to take a more optimistic view because 15 years into a monetary uh, monetary breakdown is a long time which means we're 15 years closer to a solution <clears throat> Um, and there's any number of possible solutions out there none of which are have to do with the federal reserve or governments but still so if you take the more optimistic view where we have some kind of monetary reform and agreement to, to redo the global monetary system in a way that maybe brings back some more efficiency in trade and economic cooperation, then you look at living standards in the 2030s and say, yeah, maybe there's a dip there between the 2010s and the, into the 2020s. 
And then we start to go back up in the 2030s. I think that's probably more likely the case, but I think that sets up the 2020s for a lot of um, potential misadventure because mm. it's, it, these, things, these things take time. So even if we solve the euro dollar problem today, you know, there's going to be a couple of years where we have to, you know, we have to redo everything. It takes time for everything to get involved. It takes time to reform all of these relationships and re repair them. So at the, at the earliest, we're looking at the 2030s. And when you say repair these relationships, are you talking about sort of multinational geopolitical relationships? That's what you're referring to? I'm more talking about the granular relationships between businesses doing, trying to transact in different places around the world. That's what, a, that's what the monetary, you know, the reserve currency actually does. It allows, you know, people think of a reserve currency as like it, it allows Americans to price oil in U.S. dollars. Um, you hear the term petrodollar. I mean, these things aren't real. The reserve currency is, I think it was called in the 1960s, a vehicle currency. I think of it as a middle currency. It allows different systems to intermediate through a common medium. Mm -hmm. So you have a country on the other side of the planet that uses its own currency, has its own values, has its own culture. And then you have a country on the other side of the planet with the exact opposite in every way, but yet they can transact with each other and can trust each other because they're intermediating through a common medium, which is the euro dollar. It's called the U.S. dollar, but it's really a euro dollar, and they and that's more than just they're transacting. That's they're they're depending upon this euro dollar system to accomplish a whole lot of tasks that a reserve currency does, and so as that has been breaking down, it creates a whole level of distrust, inefficiencies, and as well as you know, it, um, you know, really thinking about how whether or not these things are worth it. How you know how do we accomplish? the same kinds of things that we did yesterday in a more inefficient environment. So fixing the middle currency, fixing the reserve currency is only the first step because then you have to convince everybody that it is fixed and they can trust using it again. And that takes some time, it takes some practice and it takes a great deal of effort. And it would probably be impossible to make any kind of assumptions about how that may shake out because if step one is find a, re a, re a replacement, right? I mean. Where does your mind go on that question, first of all, when it comes to finding a replacement? Do any concepts or ideas stand out to you, Jeff? Yeah, I think we're, we're heading toward a digital currency standard. And I say that yeah. recognizing that we just went through the second cryptocurrency bubble. And I've said all along that we're going to go through these cryptocurrency bubbles, largely because people have the wrong idea about what these things are for, uh, which is understandable. Again, Fed money printing, inflation, that's all your, the dollar is going to collapse. And so in 2021, everybody piled into especially cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin because they were convinced the dollar is going to call. Here come con consumer prices. See, it's all going to fall apart. They were looking for a store of value. But that's not what we need here. As I said, the euro dollar problem is lack of elastic medium of exchange. So you have these bubbles where everybody piles into the store of value when we don't need a store of value. And that's what's happening in 2022. Everybody's realizing, oh, we didn't need a store of value because the dollar isn't collapsing. But we do need a, a good, useful medium, a useful and efficient medium of exchange, which is what a lot of crypto and digital currency projects are working on as a medium of exchange, useful. The problem is that innovation is a long ways away before it becomes a realistic alternative to the way the, the, the global monetary system works today. So we have this gap between realizing what the problem actually is, which is really step one, and then fixing it, which is fixing it with probably a, um, a system that is many years away from actually being a realistic alternative. So it's, it's, you're optimistic about maybe a digital currency future, but realizing that all these ups and downs in betweens, including bubbles in, in, in digital asset prices because of mistaken assumptions about what the issues are. Okay, I have a couple of questions off of that. So first of all, um, you know, the, the virtual digital currency concept makes sense to me because, you know, it's a transparent, immutable digital ledger, which is really all you need if the reserve currency is just a unit of exchange, right? It doesn't need to hold wealth. Right. And that's what the euro dollar has been. I think that's people, it blows people's mind that, that it's a it's a virtual ledger currency that we've been using for something like 70 years. Yes. And everybody thinks Bitcoin was the first distributed virtual currency. It was the euro dollar system that we've been using. And most people are in, are actually really aware of or they're they're familiar with. They just don't realize it. 
anytime you use your debit card, you're using a virtual currency ledger system. Yeah. So anytime you've ever used a credit card, debit card, even writing checks, writing a check, you're using a ledger system. So people don't realize we've been on a virtual currency ledger system. And so it's not that big of a leap to go into a privatized, decentralized, single ledger system where we don't prioritize the banking system to keep track of who owes what. So that's it's that's not that really difficult once people realize what, what the monetary system is all about. The problem yeah. is the government and the Federal Reserve don't want you to know this because they want you to believe the government and the Federal Reserve are where the power of money comes from. So yeah, it, it, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. So knowing that most major governments, you know, Canada included, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up in Canada, right, right. on Payments Canada's website, they're talking about their development of a uh, central bank issued digital currency, they say as much, and then they say, we have no plans to roll this out, but we want to be ready as a just in case, um, you know, US, China, like everyone's doing it. So what, yeah, what are they're not thoughts? actually doing it? That's the thing. Governments have seen the amount of progress that has taken place in the digital, the private digital currency space. And they've been way behind all along. First, I think there was the idea that they could just kill it. Right? If they if they put enough rules and regulation on it, that would be the, the end of the story. Um, and then here we are, you know, 14 years later. And if anything, despite getting the fundamentals wrong in the public, you know, the store of value that isn't necessary, these digital currencies have proliferated, and many of them have become very successful in a limited case in limited cases. So governments are thinking we better do something to make it look like we're at least monitoring, if not trying to catch up to where the private space already is. But these CBDCs are not native digital currencies, and they're nothing more than a, a, a very thin coat of paint slapped on the existing system to okay. try to make it look like, oh, we're, in the, we're competing in the digital currency space. So it's very different, uh, very different from what they're doing from what uh, private companies or private projects are doing. Okay. And so does a reserve currency have to be backed by anything? Like, does it have to be tied to a gold standard? Or, you know, I had Prime Minister Harper on the show recently, and he said, you know, our, our currency isn't backed by a hard asset, but it's backed by the taxation power of the Canadian government. Right? <laughs> of course, he would say that. And that's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate your humor there. So so you're, you shook your head. No, it doesn't have to no, be backed by any hard asset. Not. No, okay. The the issues are fundamental monetary issues and how we try to solve them. The reason that the gold standard was backed by gold was about who gets to create money. Um, in the modern euro dollar system, we've whether intentionally or whether we're aware of it or not, we've allowed the banking system to be the sole creator of money. So the banking system has privileged themselves with that creation function and they abused it and overused it, which led to the global financial crisis and then the breakdown. Mm. So the really the, the question here is who gets to create money and how does the money get created? So if you want it backed by a currency or, or backed by some form of commodity, that's just simply trying to answer who gets to create money and what are the limitations on money creation? Whereas in a digital currency format, you could actually hard code it into the currency, how much money gets created or who gets to create the money. So you can answer that question without needing to back it by a physical commodity or even the full faith and credit of the of the government of Canada. <laughs> no, it's funny and wonder because in some sense that's true, because money is all about faith and trust, and so that's why Prime Minister Harper would say something like that because what he's basically saying is you're putting your full faith and trust in the Canadian currency because it's the Canadian currency, it's Canada, right? But here we have a euro dollar system that's nominally called the U.S. dollar but it actually operates outside the United States and outside the reach of US authorities and regulators. So why does it work? Why has there been full faith and credit in the US dollar when it hasn't really been backed by the, the taxation authority of the treasury department or any gold reserves in the United States? It works because it has worked so long that people just accept that it works. There's faith in it, but there's mm -hmm. less faith in it since August of 2007 because right. it has been such a drag, which has opened the door to competing currency system, which is where this, this wave of innovation in digital currencies has come from. So a digital currency, the task before it is to prove itself as a useful and dependable medium of exchange and doing so will overcome that hurdle and that burden of trust. Doesn't need taxation authority, doesn't need physical commodity. It just needs to, use, uh, it just needs to demonstrate 
that it is a useful medium, a useful and dependable medium of exchange. Okay, another juvenile question here. When you refer to private digital currencies, what are you referring to exactly, Jeff? Things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Things like and any Bitcoin. number. You know, okay. nowadays it's mostly <clears throat> stable coins. Yeah. Um, again, with the understanding that most of those that have been offered and out there are absolute junk. They're not going to survive. Many of them yeah. are scams. They're outright scams. But that happens in any any form of disruptive technology. You go through these waves of innovation and adoption where there's a lot of resources that pile in. Nobody knows which one is going to succeed and be a winner. And so that allows a lot of mistakes to happen. It's the survivors that get that, that uh, survive that process that demonstrate usefulness. And I 100%. think that's where we go through enough of these cycles. We get a useful answer down the road that becomes a dependable medium of exchange. That's right. I mean, to quote uh, Nassim Taleb, we shouldn't be celebrating the... Uh, the founders of billion dollar companies, we should be found, we should be celebrating all the broke entrepreneurs who tried and failed yeah. and showed us what didn't work, right? That's exactly, and it's true in every form of life. It's true in commerce, is it's true in the monetary system, or it should be true in the monetary system too. And it's interesting, isn't it, Jay, that the techno the internet revolution, the technological revolution, it's it's impacted our daily, it's impacted our entire lives except for money and finance. That's been the last sort of holdout with these quote unquote old way of doing things. And I think it's because there's such a huge burden about trust because it's really what it comes down to. You know, we're, we're okay with Netflix taking over from cable companies. We'll watch Netflix and, and you know, internet-based smart TVs. But when it comes to money and banking, everybody still thinks it's like the 1920s. <laughs> you know, we still want the bank on the corner. We don't want... You know, blockchain. Why? It's all because it's about education and literacy and trust. It's about education, literacy and trust. So so if I'm understanding you correctly, you know, you would speculate that 10, 20 years down the road, what becomes the reserve currency utilized by the globe will be potentially some maybe already existing private digital currency, correct? Yeah, I wouldn't wager on a on one that's already existing. All right. All right. <laughs> I'm not so sure there. And I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I would imagine a couple of things. One is that it may be it's a private public partnership. Yeah. Um, for one reason that the, the public's public realm is they don't have very talented people, whereas in the private, these private projects have tons of <clears throat> talented, smart people doing things. So I think more likely there's a public private partnership. And I also think there's a good possibility it's not just one currency, it's several. Right. So you have a competing currency, which, by the way, is how um, you know modern economic society is operated most of the time. A single reserve currency is actually kind of unusual. There's usually several, several active at a single time. And there's no reason why you couldn't or, or no reason why we wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. Because like competition in the real economy, competition in a money marketplace. Yeah. leads to the best results 100 percent. yeah any authority or power left unchecked is always a dangerous scenario yeah, usually absolutely. ends poorly huh interesting okay so then what are your thoughts on all the fear uh right fear headlines and narratives mainly around near-term uh central bank issued digital currencies like you know there's a lot of conversations you know on twitter about what's going to have the dystopian outcome <laughs> of uh the fed releasing a cbdc and the you know breach of, of privacy that comes with this and autonomy the, the autonomy that's lost because of that what do you think about those conversations oh well, they're legitimate conversations because if we're really if we're speaking honestly here that's really the intent behind CBDCs. It's not to create an actual useful digital currency. Mm. It is to raise the level of surveillance and monitoring for mm. different reasons. I would say mm. that the Chinese CBDC is going to have a different connotation behind surveillance than maybe the Federal Reserve, although many people would probably disagree with me on that. But okay. as far as I'm concerned, you know, my position, it really, it, that's, that's really what CBDCs are for. They're, they're more about, at least in the, in, the, in the public realm, they're more about tracking and monitoring than they are offering a useful and legitimate medium of exchange. Do you think that companies that are generating Amazon, for example, half a trillion in revenue, um, you know, a few hundred million users, Facebook, 2.85 million users, and, and, you know, you know, treasuries bigger than most sovereign nations, defense budgets bigger than some sovereign nations. I mean, this is Facebook meta we're talking about, right? Multi-billion dollars spent on defense. Uh, they're almost operating like nation states at this point. And 
it would make sense that eventually they would release their own currency if we and start they tried. going to, and they tried <laughs> but they you know, never worked <laughs> the first the time way. right yeah. absolutely so, yeah and that's that's the downside i mean every transformation is messy and every transformation is fraught with risk right and the real downside is that we have a public currency that take the that's developed, uh, whether for good intentions or not, but maybe it gets in the wrong hands. Mm. Um, so maybe mm. Facebook just people have used the Libra currency because or whatever the next one is, because they find it convenient without really thinking about the downside possibility of of leaving monet. I mean, monet monetary can uh, the monetary system is a really crucial aspect, not just to commercial viability, but also politics, freedom, all of these things. And so. But we're divorced from the monetary conversation because for so long, everybody just thinks this that's the Fed, that's the government. That's not something we should even think about because that's, that's all been covered. Mm. And that's one of the good things about cryptocurrencies is that got people thinking and talking about these issues in a way they never had before. But part of that conversation needs to be, as you're thinking, Jay, that there is potential downside here. Imagine if we're operating on a corporate currency standard. Oh, God, mm. that's mm -hmm. a frightening thought. It really is. And the, But that's where, you know, decentralized, truly decentralized blockchain avoids all of those types of issues because no one single bad actor can dominate the space. And so we get, that to me is what, that's the starting point in any, any conversation for a future reserve currency. And I think most people would agree with it outside of governments. Which is why you sort of need the public-private partnership because at some point government's got to be involved in the conversation because they're going to force their way whether in, in it or not, and so you would want a a, a, a a good faith conversation, a good faith partnership between public and private, as much as that might be possible. Yeah, you mentioned something there about about uh, you know whether whether this was a decentralized currency eventually and. Governments are going to want to push their agendas forward, right? And you have a government right now who's been holding the reserve currency status for decades. They're not going to go down without a fight, I imagine. Why no, would they give up that power not. and leverage? Nor the right? banks. Remember, because the banks have been, they've been enjoying a special privilege for decades. There's yeah. a reason why the banking system has come to dominate the landscape, because they privilege themselves with money creation. Mm. And so they, they're not going to say... We're going to give all that up. No, they're, they're not going to go quietly into the long good night. They're yeah. going to fight tooth and nail for it. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on how that fight progresses here? Because, yeah, you're going to go down swinging, right? If you're the current reserve currency holder, uh, you probably got a lot more um, shells in the chamber. I don't think you've spent them all yet. A lot, lot more tools you have access to. Uh, what are some outcomes, you know, this 10, 15 year transition, like anything stand out, Jeff, is some actions U.S. government Fed might take? I think about it from the other side, the private side. I think the, the, okay. the most optimistic scenario here is that the digital currencies begin to prove themselves and prove themselves and do so under the radar so that by the time the government sees it as a threat, it's already too late. Uh, because enough people are using it, enough companies are using it, enough maybe countries are using it. That they can't kill it. They can't say we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna deprive you of the use of this this whatever this format is. And so it, the more that these digital currencies prove themselves and do so in sort of a quiet way that doesn't disturb the status quo too much, there's that possibility that eventually it reaches a critical threshold. And before you know it, everybody's just using, or enough people are using it that it's moved on and it's moved into the final phase of transition. Which, by the way is exactly what happened with the euro dollar system. The euro dollar system began in the 1950s and nobody knew it except mm. the bankers that were operating it. By the time anybody talked about the euro dollar, which was in the late 1960s in any, any, any substantial uh, way, it had already taken over the functions of reserve currency. So by then the government just said, you know what, this is solved. This solved a problem that we had, Triffin's paradox. So let's just leave it alone. Mm. And uh, maybe there's a there's a way that the digital currency can do that in the in the way forward because you have a private bank centered virtual currency ledger money system. Why not have the same just remove the banks? Again, the banks are not going to like that, but we could just some, do something different as long as it proves itself as a useful medium of exchange. Then is um, I think that that's the way forward. But you know. What are governments going to do in response once they realize that there's a competing currency out there? Well, they're going to do what they've already done up to this point. I mean, 
They're going to use their taxation authority. Look at what they did in Bitcoin. And I think it was with 2013, 2014, where they say you got to treat Bitcoin as a, as a, a collectible. Um, they're going to use taxation authority. They're going to use regulatory authority. There are going to, there are going to be measures where if governments perceive hostility or perceive that this is outside of their ability to manipulate and to influence at the very least influence, they'll, they'll, they'll try to, um, they'll try to at least, uh, Make sure that uh, the public, the, the the public as they see it, has a seat at the table. Yes, and maybe simultaneously, if they're running a second game, say let's speculate. I'm not I'm not saying that I think Bitcoin's going to be that currency because I, I don't. But let's say it becomes that, and the government eventually starts to realize, you know, we've let this gone too far. I think that ship has already sailed, to be honest. They can't shut that down. Yep. But they say, you know, if you can't beat him, you got to join him. And so start covertly acquiring and accumulating. Would that not be the best strategy is to at least have as big of a piece of that 21 million pie as possible? If you're in a fixed monetary system, that's the danger. That's the risk. And that's where Bitcoin already is. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin is already held by too few hands to begin with, which is why you have all these side pools that are developing, yeah. realizing that Bitcoin Store value was the wrong idea. We need a useful medium of exchange, and that means elasticity. Uh, elasticity. So if you have currencies uh -huh. that are not easily accumulated, uh, there's lots of stable coins that are working on that idea yeah, that yeah, have yeah. a dynamic money supply that sort of circumvents the ability of governments to control through um, cornering the market, which is one of the downsides to a fixed currency regime. Yes. Okay, I got to ask... What are you doing? Um, and I know you're not a portfolio manager. You don't give investment advice, nor do I. So I totally respect that. But you know, can you share anything on how you've positioned yourself, knowing that the next, the remainder of this decade is probably going to be like the beginning of this decade, continued increased unpredictable volatility, right? And so if that's the case, like, are you more are you more leaning on hard assets at this point in your in your portfolio, are you pretty diverse? Are you pretty simple? Anything you want to share on that front, Jeff? I think it's it's a it's about being careful and considered, okay. because there are opportunities in that volatility, as you, as you rightly point out. Um, there's these cycles, there's these swings, and the cryptocurrency cycle can be extremely beneficial. You could ride it up and then get out at the top and come down, or even you don't even need to get, you don't even need to get close to the top. You just realize that there are these volatility swings that go back and forth. And so right where, where we are right now in the cycle is more toward the deflationary end of it. So in terms of the near-term future, you want to be thinking about maybe more defensive, uh, maybe more risk-averse strategies, um, but with the thought that eventually the pendulum is going to swing back in the other direction. That doesn't mean inflation. That just means less deflation. And you have these, you know, these, these back and forth cycles in various places that you might want to take advantage of as much as you possibly can. It just, you know, looking forward, and we were reminded of this, reminded of this this week, the next big trade might be the next big pendulum swing in the cycle might be long duration. Because mm -hmm. if the Fed has reached its limit in, in rate hikes, we go into recession, we maybe have some major disruption in the monetary system, which there's all sorts of warning signs about that. Um, interest rates are going to fall. So there's an opportunity to ride this part of the cycle understanding that there's tremendous amounts of risk here, that uh, there's an opportunity to ride this part of the cycle where maybe this, uh, th from here forward, maybe you want to go long bonds. So it really depends upon your awareness of these cycles and what you think and what you're, what you're really trying to do um, as far as opportunities with them. I love that. Look, I, you know, I didn't know what the Euro dollar system was until I heard you start talking about it. I would say I still have a grade two understanding of this system, <laughs> but I appreciate, you know, the content you're creating, right. And putting this stuff forward. So check out Euro dollar university to begin. That's, that's one of your projects, Jeff, where can I push people to? They want to hear more from you and, and learn more about these topics. Well, the website is eurodollar.university where we've got uh, memberships, educational videos, things like that, subscriptions to research. And if you're just interested in, in talking about it, I have a YouTube channel. It's Euro dollar university too. There's usually a video there almost every day. So we go into the deep dives, the analysis behind the monetary system, the complications, the consequences of everything that's going on there. Appreciate that, Jeff. Look, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for coming on again. It's always fascinating chatting with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jay. So it was a pleasure.
Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you wanna take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video and you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.